I would like to just thank the sponsors of this conference. We have sponsors for the Everlasting Flame project as a whole, but in particular those who've sponsored the conference, uh, the British Institute of Persian Studies, who came in very early with generous uh, support for the conference and allowed us to begin to plan it. Also the Iran Heritage Foundation and the Sudavar Memorial Foundation. I'd like to thank Dr. Arshin Ardib Magadam, who is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies within the LMEI uh, for hosting this event, and also to staff of the LMEI who've been fantastic in organizing the conference and um, putting it all together. So uh, the director, of course, Dr. Hassan Hakimian, Louise Hoskin, Vincenzo Pachi, and Valentina Zanardi. I'd also like to thank Mrs. Farida Seddon, who's helping us today. In particular, of course, I have a vote of thanks to, my, uh, to the co-conveners, um, Alan Williams, Professor Alan Williams and Professor Almut Hintzer. So I just want to say very briefly a couple of uh, things about the conference and, and the way it's linked um, to the exhibition that opened last night. We're talking today about identity formation. Everything on display in the exhibition forms part of a narrative that by definition draws on the past, and it's this past that shaped the way in which Zoroastrians have understood their faith, and it has influenced the perceptions of others who've come into contact with Zoroastrianism at various times throughout its long history. And in putting together the exhibition, certain characteristics unique to Zoroastrianism and the formation of identity uh, emerged, and I'll just touch on these very briefly. The paucity of material available for the early period in Zoroastrianism, the relatively late arrival of the Avesta into the world of scholarship in the 18th century, the elusive nature of its ancient texts and the lack of theological development after the 9th century in Iran are all factors that have given rise to a multiplicity of theories about the origins and nature of Zoroastrianism. In consequence, <coughs> Zoroastrians and non-Zoroastrians alike, priests and lay people continued to debate the origins of the Avestan language, the genesis of the religion and the purport of its doctrines, the date, birthplace, and even the very existence of Zarathustra. The Garthas have been scrutinized for answers to such questions as to whether or not Zarathustra advocated the abandonment of the narcotic Halma and the practice of the blood sacrifice, whether the religion is essentially monotheistic or dualistic, terms, of course, which are best understood within the context of the Abrahamic religions, the practice of Hwedoda, or next of kin marriage, and the rigorous purity laws prescribed in the young Avesta and Pahlavi texts are issues that have generated discussion and sometimes polarized debate. One of the outcomes has been to return, that is to seek authority in the teachings of Zarathustra. And in Iran, this is termed the Gatha Puyan, or return to the Gatha. So the conference today and the exhibition in the Brunei Gallery does not seek to answer these questions, but they do provide context and a platform for debate. And this is achieved by bringing together the leading scholars in the field of Zoroastrianism, who you are going to hear speaking today. I'm now going to hand you over to Professor Alan Williams, who will introduce our first panel. Thank you. We're going to start uh, on a high, and we're going to stay on that high. Uh, we're going to start with uh, scripture and its influence on tradition. Uh, scripture and significance for the tradition. We have three very eminent um, uh, speakers today. Uh, we have Professor Almut Hinser. Uh, we have uh, Dastuji Dr. Firoz Kotwal from Mumbai. And we have Dr. Uh, Professor Alberto Cantera from Salamanca in Spain. Um, now, I'm going to do something unusual, which is you've all got a copy of these, haven't you? So I'm going to allow you to read for yourself their biographies rather than read them out. Now, they're very distinguished. They've published many books, and uh, you can read all about them in this handbook. So I'd like to start now. It's exactly half past nine. I'd like to be very strict with you about time uh, because time is so short. We have an hour and 45 minutes for each session uh, uh, in this conference, and so we're dividing it up into three 30-minute slots, 
uh, which will leave 15 minutes at the end for a discussion. So if you have questions during the papers, would you please write your questions down succinctly? And then at the end, in that 15 minutes, we'll take questions on all three papers. That would be the general practice for the whole conference. That's the way we found it works best. So let's begin. I'd invite the speakers to come to this, the platform. So um, my, our first speaker this morning is the Zartushti Brothers Professor of Zoroastrianism here at SOAS, and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Almud Hintzer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues and friends, dear ladies and gentlemen, the term Zoroastrianism, the name of the religion to which this wonderful exhibition is devoted, is a relatively recent coinage that is based on the Greek variety Zoroaster of the name of the religious, religion's founder, Zarathustra. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, it first occurs in 1874 in Principles of Comparative Philology by the Oxford Assyriologist, the Reverend Henry, uh, Archibald Henry says, in connection, of course, with the religion of the ancient Persians. The indigenous Zoroastrian sources, however, refer to this religion in Avestan as Daina, from which derives Dain in Middle and Dean in New Persian. The word Dina literally means vision or worldview. It is formed from the verb Di, whose meaning to see is alive to the present day, for instance, in the Persian verb Didan, to see. However, rather than seeing with the physical eyes, the noun Dina denotes the activity of seeing in one's mind, so to speak, seeing with the eye of one's mind, and especially what is produced by such an activity, that is, thought, conviction, belief, or vision. It is a Zoroastrian technical term. In the Avesta, which constitutes the oldest source for our knowledge of the Zoroastrian religion, the word Daina is usually qualified by an attribute, a fact that is indicative that there is more than one Daina. To be precise, the Avesta speaks of two, one which is described as good and which is promoted, and one which, is, which it describes as bad and which it vehemently rejects and opposes. The Daina favored by the Avesta is usually qualified as Mazda Yasni, that is, the Daina of a person whose Yasna, or ritual worship, is dedicated to Mazda. Occasionally, she is further characterized as belonging to Zarathustra, Zarathustri, as belonging to the Lord, Ahuiri, as good, Vangvihi, and best, Vahishta. According to the Zoroastrian tradition, the Daina that focuses on the worship of Mazda, the Daina Mazda Yasni, was revealed by the god Ahura Mazda to Zarathustra, and the latter urges everyone to embrace it. Those who have done so are of good belief, that is, who Daina, because their Daina is Mazda Yasni, that is, the belief which belongs to a person who worships Mazda. Moreover, she is personified as a female whose father is Ahura Mazda and whose mother is Armaiti. At the same time, she is also the sister of Ashi, reward, of Srausha, hearkening, Rashnu, justice, and Mithra, contract. The other Daina, which the Avesta opposes, is that of those who worship and sacrifice not to Mazda, but to the divers. The latter are, of course, the gods of the Indo-Iranian, Indo-Iranians, the prehistoric ancestors of the Iranian and Indo-Aryan peoples, and indeed, even further back in time, the gods of the Indo-Europeans. In all Indo-European languages, the equivalent of Iranian Daiva means God. Such is the case, for instance, in Vedic Sanskrit Deva and Latin Deus, and in the adjective Divinus, divine. But everywhere in Iranian, although, or almost everywhere in Iranian, this word for God has changed its meaning into its opposite, 
The old gods have become false gods in the Gathas and then demons in the younger Avesta, the devs of the Pahlavi literature and the devs in New Persian. The Avesta describes the Daina of those who worship or sacrifice to the divas as Daiva, Daina Daiva Yasna Nam. She's evil, Aga, and she belongs to Angra, mind you, the destructive force which embodies evil. And she also belongs to the deceitful ones, Druvant. Those people who have it are Dujdaina, that means of bad belief. The Avesta thus distinguishes two convictions or diners, embraced by two groups of people respectively, those who worship Mazda, the Mazda Yasnas, and, those that, and who therefore have a good diner, and those who worship the divas, the Daiva Yasnas, and whose diner is bad. The criterion for whether a diner is good or bad is whether or not its owner worships Mazda and therefore observes ritual practices connected with the cult of Mazda rather than those connected with the cult of divers. Ahura Mazda is Yazata, that is worthy of worship, and the divers and their chief, Angra, mind you, are Ayesnia, not to be worshipped. The Avesta promotes the Mazda worshipping belief and aims at reducing the numbers of those who practice the Daiva worshipping one. The Daina Mazda Yasni entails both a belief system and a set of precisely defined ritual and devotional practices. Such practices include the correct recitation of the sacred text, the Avesta, the wearing of the kusti, that's the sacred thread which is tied around the waist, for example. By adhering to the prescribed practices, a person, men and women alike, shame their own personal daina during their lifetime. The Gathas put it this way. He who makes his own thought better or worse, O wise one, makes better or worse his belief, that is Dina, by his action and word. She follows his leanings, likings, and choices. Since a person's Dina is seen with the eyes of one's mind rather than with the eyes of one's body, it cannot be physically beheld and described as long as the individual is alive. It can only be recognized from the person's action. Actions. However, it becomes, the diner becomes visible in its true form after death. It is at that point that the immortal soul's enc soul encounters its own diner. The encounter of the soul with its own diner after death is a powerful motive that pervade, pervades the entire Zoroastrian tradition. It is found not only in literary sources in Avestan, Middle Persian and Sogdian, but also in figurative art. During this encounter, the soul who initially does not recognize that the female who approaches it is its own diner, engages in a conversation with the diner, in the course of which the diner reveals to the soul that she is not a woman, but the embodiment of the deceased actions performed while alive. She further explains how she acquired the appearance which she now has and which the soul sees for the first time with its eyes. In this talk, I propose to focus on this dialogue and especially on the explanations which the diner gives to the soul of how it acquired its shape. Against this backdrop, we shall then look at a Sogdian image of what has been interpreted as representing the two diners. In the Avesta, the most detailed description of the encounter is found in the Hadochtnask. The text offers accounts of the respective fates of the truthful and deceitful ones. The two accounts run parallel, but differ from one another in significant detail. Both are, represent, are presented as answers given by Ahura Mazda to questions asked by Zarathustra about the fate of the soul after death and the fate of the soul of the truthful and deceitful persons respectively. So Ahura uh, Mazda's answer is, uh, with regard to the truthful soul, then said Ahura Mazda, it, that means the soul, sits near the head reciting the Ushtavaiti Gata, 
calling upon happiness, Usta Ahmai, Yahmai Usta Kahmai Chit, Vazur Shayoz Mazda Dayad Ahuro. In that night, the soul experiences as much joy as all this living existence. And what happens to the soul of the deceitful person who worshipped the divers? Then said Ahura Mazda, there, O truthful Zarathustra, it scuttles about near the head, reciting the Garthic Kimom word, Kam ne me zam Ahura Mazda, kuthra ne me ayini. In that night, the soul experiences as much unjoy as all this living existence. In both cases, after death, the soul hovers around the head of the dead body for three days and nights. But the soul of the truthful one sits orderly by the head of the body, while that of the deceitful one scuttles about nervously. It knows terrible things are about to happen. The soul of the truthful person recites two verses from the Ushtavaiti Gata, incorrect Old Avestan. But the Old Avestan language of the line from the Kumna Maiza Gata, Yasna 46.1, which the soul of the deceitful person recites, is corrupt. In uh, Yasna uh, 40, in Hadurt nach 2.2, 220, it's, it, um, uh, the, the quotation of the Gothic verse in Hadurt nach 220 displays young Avestan features including the word final E for old Avestan oi and the shortening of word final long vowels. Moreover, the insertion of the name of Ahura Mazda, whom the deceitful one has refused to worship during lifetime, but invokes now at this stage, into the quotation of the Gothic line, destroys the Gothic meter of four plus seven syllables. This situation goes on then for three days and nights, and at the dawn of the third night, the soul has to move on. The truthful one seems to be passing through flowers and enjoy lovely perfumes and southerly breezes, but the deceitful one passes through frozen grounds, smelling stench, and is exposed to cold northern winds. It is out of this wind that his own diner appears to be emerging to the soul. The diner of the truthful person is described in great detail as a beautiful maiden. In this wind appears to him advancing his own belief, diner, in the form of a beautiful, majestic maiden, white-armored, strong, well-grown, upright, tall, with high breasts, of able body, noble, of glorious stock, of 15 years in looks, in form so much more beautiful than the most beautiful creatures. Then the soul of the truthful man asks, asking, says to her, what woman are you who are in body the most beautiful of women I have ever seen? Then said to him his own belief, I am indeed, O young man of good thought, good word, good deed, good belief, your own belief of your own self. Who loved you with such greatness, goodness and beauty, with fragrance, victoriousness, resistance against hostilities, as you appear to me, asks, of course, the soul. O oh, young, you loved me, O oh, young man, of good thought, good word, good deed, good belief, with that greatness, goodness, and beauty, with fragrance, victoriousness, resistance against hostilities, as I appear to you. Each time you saw another person making blazes, practicing Bausavas and Varuchasras, making a strew of plants. Then you used to sit down, reciting the gathas, worshipping the good waters and the fire of Ahura Mazda, gratifying the truthful man coming from near and from far. This passage tells us exactly in what consists the good deeds that produce a good diner. That is, to sit down and recite the gathas, to worship the good waters and the fire of Ahura Mazda. All of this happens, of course, when the Yasna ritual is celebrated with the Gathas and the Yasna Haptang Haiti at its center. 
Such good behavior markedly contrasts with that of the deceitful person who performs ritual practices which the truthful one opposed and counteracted. Unfortunately, however, some of the words describing the rejected ritual practices have so far not been fully understood and therefore been left untranslated here. But it is clear that the diva worshipping Dinah neither recited the gathas nor worshipped the good waters and the fire of Ahura Mazda while alive. Performing the prescribed rituals thus makes the Dinah Mazdayasni being dear, dearer, being beautiful, more beautiful, being honoured, more honoured. Moreover, she who sits on a prominent seat is made to sit on a more prominent seat. As a result, the worship of Ahura Mazda is promoted. Then, speaks the diner. I think we can ignore this. <laughs> then, speaks the diner. Then you made me being dear, dearer, being beautiful, more beautiful, being honored, more honored, sitting on a prominent seat, you used to make me sit on a more prominent seat by means of this good thought, this good speech, this good deed. Thereupon, men worship me, namely Ahura Mazda, as one who is worshipped for a long time and conversed with. Please note the switch of the identity of the me. At the beginning of this verse, the me, the I, is the Daina who speaks, and that the last line, the I, is Ahura Mazda. So the two here are identical by, worship, by making the Daina more beautiful, Ahura Mazda is being promoted. The description of the bad Daina should be in anal analogous but negative terms. Unfortunately, however, all the manuscripts abbreviate here. As a result, the description of the bad diner survives neither here nor elsewhere in Avestan, although we can expect that her description is in parallel but negative terms to that of the good diner. In the Pahlavi texts, the bad day diner is painted as an ugly, stinking hag, a whore, naked, corrupted, sullied, bandy-legged, lean-hipped, covered with a continuous phlegm. And in imagery that derives from descriptions of the demon of the corpse, the Avestan Druj Nazu. Against this background of the Avestan account of the fate of the encounter of the soul with its diner, let us now look at an image which is thought to be one of the diners, indeed possibly of the two, the good and the bad one. From the Achaemenid period until far into Islamic times, Zoroastrianism, the Zoroastrian religion and worldview, the Daina Mazdayazni, constituted a major intellectual force in the Near and Middle East and in Central Asia. Promoted by various imperial Iranian dynasties, Zoroastrian ideas and religious practices spread as far as Egypt and Asia Minor in the West and were carried to to the east by Iranian, especially Soktian merchants along the Silk Road to Central Asia and China. We know that in the first millennium of the Christian era, there was a sizable community of expatriate Soktians at Dunhuang, that is a city on the Silk Road, which is located Dunhuang, a town on the Silk Road in northwest China, and that a form of Zoroastrianism was among the many religions practiced there. By the 10th century, Sogdian communities at Dunhuang lived in a largely Turkish and Chinese and predominantly Buddhist environment. While being influenced, by being fully integrated, they preserved their distinctive traditions. This is borne out by evidence for a Sogdian Mazda Yasnian temple at Dunhuang. Unfortunately, no archaeological traces survive, but Chinese sources mention regular supply of commodities to the temple, including sheets of drawing paper used for the production of devotional images. 
that were carried in Mazda Yasnin religious processions at Dunhuang. And they must have included this one. This is a line drawing in ink, touched up with orange-red paint on a sheet of coarse paper, measuring about 38 by 30 centimeters. It was found by Paul Pelliot in the early 20th century in the manuscript cave at Dunhuang, and is now kept at the, at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. On stylistic grounds, the drawing has been dated to the 9th to the 10th century, centuries. Franz Grini, who kindly sent me this picture, noted that a photograph published in 1978 still showed a string, which has now disappeared, on the upper edge, indicating that the image was intended to be hung on a stand for display. Since the drawing is unaccompanied by any text, the interpretation has to be based solely on iconographic observations. The drawing shows two young women seated opposite each other. Both have a halo and are physically identical, except that the left figure has two and the right has four arms. However, sorry. Oh, I've lost it. Something, I'm sorry about that. Never mind. Um, the eyes of the figure on the left are wide open, while those of the figure on the right are half closed. They both wear a butt shaped headgear, but the left one is filled with a grid pattern that on the right is filled with scales. The flowers in the hair of the left figure are four, those of the right are two. The two figures differ not only with regard to their attributes, but also in the way they are dressed. Both women wear long folded skirts and tunic, but the dress of the left figure is held attached to the body by means of three cords, each tied with a knot in front, while the cloak of the right figure is loose and floating. Both have a nimbus or a halo, which has been understood as representing supernatural power, whether good or bad. Franz Grenet and Jean Guangda, who published the first detailed iconographic analysis of this image, argued that the drawing shows the two Zoroastrian visions, or diners, the good on the left and the bad on the right. The positive attributes of the good diner include the miniature dog on the plate in her left hand, an animal which the Zoroastrian tradition holds in highest esteem and which is associated with the diner when she appears to the soul after death. Furthermore, the threefold soft belt around her waist looks like what is known as the kusti, the protective belt of the Zoroastrian. It is worn by Zoroastrians to the present day as a reminder to produce good thoughts, good words, and especially good deeds. Zoroastrians untie and retie the, two, the, uh, the kusti while prayerfully reciting verses from the gathas and other texts. It also symbolizes the protection which the Daina Mazdayasni affords against the forces of evil. And she's even identified with it. Uh, for, the, the, the kusti is identified with the Daina Mazda Yasni in Yasna 9.26, the girdle, that's Ivyonghana in Avestan, which is bedecked with stars, fashioned by the spirit. Here it's a metaphor for the Milky Way. The good Mazda worshipping belief. And here you see a Parsi girl uh, from the 19th century also wearing the, this kusti just in, the, in this way, tied over her a shirt, the Sudre. That Zoroastrians of the time when the, uh, the image, the, 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 the drawing was made, also uh, wore the kusti emerges, for instance, from the front wall of a 5th to 10th century ossuary from the necropolis at Krasnorechens uh, Krasnore in Kyrgyzstan. It shows two priests attending to the Ritrufar. In addition to the kusti, they also wear mouth sheets, and the right figure carries a bowl in his left hand, which may be compared with the bowl which the left woman carries in her right hand. 
The figure on the right, by contrast, obviously accumulates attributes which the Zoroastrian religion categorizes as negative, in particular, obnoxious animals, or hrafstras, namely the wolf on which she sits, the snake in her left hand, and the creature on her finger, on the finger of her right hand, um, the identity of which is not quite clear. It could be a beetle or a scorpion or perhaps a crayfish. A significant contrast to the figure opposite is that the woman is in direct physical contact with these animals. The accumulation of attributes which the Zoroastrian tradition evaluates as negative strongly supports Grenet and Zhang's ident identification of this figure with the bad Dane. A complication, however, arises from the fact that the upper two arms holding the sun and the moon disk are also an iconographic feature typical of the goddess Nana, a Mesopotamian deity, deity who ascended to become one of the chief goddesses of the Sogdians in their homeland. Was, Rana, was Nana rejected and demonized by the expatriate Sogdians of Dunhuang far away from their homeland? That's something which uh, Grenet and Zhang consider. By contrast, Gitti Azapai has recently argued that rather than the bad Dinah, the figure on the right is in fact the goddess Nana. She suggests that the attributes of wolf, snake, and scorpion are rendered harmless and compliant in Nana's hands and interprets what looks like a belt hanging down from her left knee as the tamed wolf's leash. In her view, the banner shows two Zoktian two Sogdian goddesses, the Zoroastrian Daina on the left and Nana on the right. It would have been used in religious processions at Dunhuang to parade the two goddesses. Not being an art historian, I'm in no position to fully evaluate the iconographic evidence and arguments put forward for each of the two interpretations. However, from the point of view of the Zoroastrian text, an association of Nana, who elsewhere, like as here, where she is shown as riding uh, on a lion, uh, she, she rides on a lion rather than a wolf. And her association with the creatures which the Zoroastrian religion deeply and vehemently abhors seems plausible only if the Zoroastrian uh, the Zoroastrians of Dunhuang rejected, Dina as a dive, uh, rejected Nana as a diver, together with all other diving creatures. A different line of explanation could be if that figure on the right is not taken to represent specifically Nana, for four and six armored figures have their origins in Indian Hindu iconography and are very common along the Silk Road, with its great cultural diversity. The detail is found, for instance, also in the numerous representations of Avalokitesvara or Avalokiteshvara, such as this one here, from a 10th century hanging scroll from Dunhuang. It shows the Chinese version of Avalokitesvara Guanyin, who mostly represents the Bodhisattva as a savior of human beings from dangers of all kinds or as a guide of souls towards the pure land of Amitabha, obviously in a Buddhist context. The four-armed figure would then be an iconographic marker which the Dunhuang Zoroastrians employed to represent a non-Iranian deity, in particular some deity of a religion in which Deva means God. The image would then represent the Daina Daiva Yasnanam, the belief of those who worship divers, and show a four-armed goddess, a Devi, closely associated with and in direct contact with divic creatures. Finally, let us briefly consider the way in which the eyes of the two figures are depicted. While they represent two different iconographic styles, which are also found elsewhere, it could be argued that it is significant that the artist has chosen to represent the Mazda Yasnian Daina with the eyes wide open, and those of the Daina of the Daivayasnas half closed. 
For from the Gartas on, the Zoroastrian tradition places great emphasis on considering with a clear mind the choices which each person has to make. It says in the Gartas, Yasna 30.2, listen with your ears to the best things. Look with a clear mind at the choices of decision, man for man for himself. If interpreted, and the, word, the verb for look here is vain, which is the verb to see with the physical eyes, but also here, of course, with the eyes of one's mind. If interpreted in the light of this passage, the wide open eyes could express the idea instilled into Zoroastrians up to the present day to look at the possible choices with a clear mind and to be aware that each person is responsible for and has to bear the consequences of the decisions they make with regard to their religion. By contrast, the half-closed eyes of the woman on the right could be seen in the light of another Gothic verse, Yasna 30.6, according to which those who chose to the destructive force did not distinguish clearly between the two choices and chose wrongly because they were deceived. They did not look with a clear mind. Between these two forces, any false god, the divers, failed to discriminate rightly because deception came over them as they were deliberating with one another when they chose the worst thought. Thereupon they rushed into violence by which they sickened the existence of the mortal. Just as the two forces, the creative and the destructive one, <coughs> are presented as twins in an earlier stanza of the same hymn, Yasna 30, so also the two diners here look like mirror images of one another. However, just like the two antagonistic forces, in reality, they are fundamentally different, incompatible with one another, and mutually exclusive. The one on the right is the Daina Daiva Yasnanam, the religion of the Daiva worshippers. The one on the left represents the Daina Mazda Yasni, the Mazda worshipping religion. She's seated on a throne, having been put in a prominent position by the Zoroastrians of Dun Huang, thanks to their worship of Ahura Mazda in the prescribed way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Almut, and thank you for keeping to your time. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dastogy Dr. Firoz M. Kotwal from uh, Mumbai. He's come a long way to be here to give his talk today. I'd like to invite him to come to the podium uh, to talk to us today on his chosen subject of Continuity, Controversy, and Change, a study in the ritual practice of the Bagaria priests of Navsari. It is truly a pleasure to be here in this August gathering of scholars to witness the inauguration of this superb exhibition. Allow me to offer my hearty thanks to the organizers of this conference, Dr. Sarah Stewart, Professor Almut Hinze, and Firoza Pantaki Mistri, to the patron of the exhibit, Mr. Zubin Mehta, and to the donors, who have made this exhibit possible, including Mr. Cyrus Punavala, Mr. Nasli Vadia, and others. In today's lecture, I am going to speak to you about the subject of continuity and change in Zoroastrian ritual practice. Though it is often noted in histories of Zoroastrian religion, that ritual practice has historically remained very conservative, such that many rituals are still practiced today in the same way in which they were centuries ago. Still, 
a number of rituals attested in documents of previous centuries have been lost or are only maintained by small groups of priests. It is these rituals which I will be focusing my attention today. After their arrival in India, Parsi priests, as members of what is called in Gujarati, the Khorasani Mandali, that is the congregation of Khorasan. They have maintained the ancient ritual practices as practiced by their ancestors in Khorasan. Yet in ensuing centuries, differences in practice have emerged between different Panthaks. And in modern times, controversies regarding the correct performance of ritual have raged among the Parsi priestly community. In this talk, I will illustrate this phenomenon by examining four examples of divergence in ritual practices with illustrations from Avestan and Pahlavi manuscripts, Persian riwayats, Gujarati documents pertaining to the Bhagasat priestly Anjuman, and observations on contemporary practice. First, I will discuss the ritual recitation of the letters of the Avestan alphabet at the beginning of the Naujot ceremony, as is maintained by the Sanjana Panthak of Udvada. Then I shall examine the ritualized action of bowing to the sun in the performance of the Kvarshe Nyayishan. I will then explore the origins of a priestly controversy concerning the correct performance of the Afrinagan e Fristag of Hiraste and the Afrinagan e Rosgar. Finally, I shall discuss the history of the ritual offering of fat of a sacrificial animal to the fire, what we call in Pelvi Atesh Zohar, and the controversy which emerged in the early 19th century between the Bagaria priest of Nausari and the Bombay Parsi Panchayat regarding its practice. <clears throat> Ritual recitation of the Avestan alphabet. At the age of seven, it is typical for Parsi children to have their Naujot ceremonies performed, whereby, after undergoing a ritual bath, nan, and reciting the patet or penitentiary prayer, the dinno kalmo, the word of religion, and the yatha ahu vairyo prayer, the child decides the nirangi kustig and ties their kusti around their waist for the first time. Yet if the ceremony is performed in the village of Udvara, within the panthak of the Sanjana priests, the naujot is performed slightly differently. Before reciting the Dinno Kalmo, the child is made to recite the following lines transcribed from a Sanjana ritual manual in text 1-1 one, one in the handout. Badaomi Yezad Bakshaoyende Dadgare Dada Badaomi Yezdan Ga 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 ha, ga hung ga ha, a ga hung ga ha, kao kaiye, karahile, ja ja jaiye, sa sa saiye, ja sa naam maha, ananaya hai maha, da 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 ha, tha 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 ha, 
आइए जच चइए आओ उ आओ ईये अमा मैये मा ई वोय अंग हो मैये मा यथा अहु वेरियो वन एंड अशेम वो वन एज यू मे हैव नोटिस्ड दिस शॉर्ट रेसिटेशन कंटेन्स ऑल ऑफ द लेटर्स ऑफ द अवेस्टर्न अल्फाबेट arrange in a pseudo phonetic pattern according to the sto khurshed of udvada recitation of this practice is performed by all boys and girls who have the naujors performed in udvada for those who do not belong to the sanjana panthak and who do not memorize the alphabet the priest performing the ceremony will recite it on behalf of the child while the practice may at first seem a curiosity in former times the ritual recitation of the avestan alphabet was apparently a custom even outside of the sanjana panthak for example a khorde avastha in the mehzirana library held under the shelf mark F7 which is an accurate copy of the manuscript of Hormuz they are from Rose begins with what is referred to as the harf ha e zand the letters of the zand in which the identical text is found likewise in an autograph copy of dar of Hormuz they are revived held in the university of bombay library under the self mark persian manuscript 29 copied in 1678 ce reproduced as text 1.2 on your handout in a section commencing with the phrase harf ha e avesta zand but a wish a hindustan mean nivisam i will write the letters of the zend avasta in the manner of india darab hum is there gives the text exactly corresponding to that recited in the sanjana navjot ceremony though there is no indication in either manuscript that the text is to be used during the navjot ceremony the introductory formulas and the prayers which follow the alphabet indicate that the text was meant to be recited orally one can therefore surmise that the practice of reciting the alphabet was intended as an educational exercise whereby a child would acquire a rudimentary literacy in the avestan script indeed ritual recitation of the avestan alphabet seems to have been a known custom in recent times in 1867 dastur hosang ji jamas ji of pune writes that quote the parsi priest in india attests the character of sacredness to the avestan alphabet many pious mobits repeat it when reciting the daily prayers just as pious brahmins repeat the first sutra of panini when performing their brahma yagna thus preserved in the sanjana navjot ceremony is perhaps a ritualized vestige of religious education which has otherwise been lost in contemporary practice performing homage to the sun in kvarshed nyayishin in certain cases it is possible to determine 
when a particular ritual practice fell out of use. For instance, in the performance of the Khorsed and Mihir Nyayasans, it used to be the practice that after the recitation of Nyayas 1.5, that is para 5, or first Nyayas, the reciter would recite a passage specific to the time of day, that is Ga, it was, <clears throat> then recite the Ashen Bohu three times, each time bowing deeply in reverence toward the sun before continuing with the recitation. This practice was already known in the ninth century when it is referred to in the Denkard as Gose Konik has recently noted <clears throat> in the transmission of the Avesta. Text 2.1. When he knowingly and thoughtfully in his action reaches the end of the speech, he should say, Ashem Bohu, that is Allahi Stayishli, three times. And at the end of each passage, he should bow deeply. This ritual action is also referred to in several important manuscripts of the Kordiyavastha, notably manuscript T12 of the Merzirana Library, an old and important manuscript comprising texts of the Kordiyavastha, the Siro Zak, and Whisperer, written by the famous Dastur Asdin Kaka in 1551 CE. The manuscript includes ritual directions written in Pahlavi. Following the text of Nyayas 1.5, the text adds, see text 2.2, recite three Asimbohus, with each one should take a step and with each one should bow deeply. In his edition of the Pelvi Kordevasta, Dabar also notes that later manuscripts of the Kordevasta, U1, U3, D, add to this instruction the phrase and with each Asimbohu one should lower one's head. That there was controversy about how the ritual action was to be performed is already evident from the riwayat of Nariman Husheng, sent to the priests of Gujarat from the Dastus of Turkabad and Sharifabad in Iran in the year 1478 CE. Apparently, there had been a question as to whether one should fully prostrate oneself by placing one's head to the ground while reciting the Ashimvahus or whether one should simply bow. The Iranian priest write, now text 2.3, during the Khurshid Nyayas, there is no need to place one's head on the ground, but bowing, namaz, salutation, salam, and veneration, ikram, are necessary and appropriate. From this text, the practice of lowering one's head and bowing entered into early printed texts of the Kordeyavastha during the 19th century. The Sensai Tabam Kordevasta, <clears throat> written by Behedin Dadabai Kavasi, published in 1874, contains the following instruction after Nyayas 1.5, text 2.4. While reciting each Asimbohu, one should lower one's head and bow. However, it is worth noting 
that the practice of bowing one's head during the Kvarsenyayashun seems to have been entirely absent from Kadimi ritual practice in the early 19th century. The instruction is not to be found in the Kadimi Korde Avesta of the Daftar Askara Press of 1843 CE. Even Behedin Dada Bhai Kavazi, who had printed the ritual instruction in a Sensai Korde Avesta, omitted it <clears throat> from his Kadmi Tamam Korde Avesta, published in the same year, 1874. Later, printed Khorde Avesta, even those intended for Sansahis, began to omit the practice. Some innovated even further. Frambros Sorabji Chinivala's Khorde Avesta Bhak Shnum Tavil, Bombay 1938, omits the ritual gesture entirely. As a result, the ritualized bowing to the sun during the recitation of the Nyayishan has been lost in contemporary practice. The recitation of the Karda or section of Yao Visada during the Afrinaga. <clears throat> Throughout Zoroastrian history, matters of ritual practice have repeatedly been the subject of controversies between priests. This phenomenon was already attested in the 9th century when the high priest of the city of Sirgan, Zatspram, <coughs> attempted to simplify the Barashnum ritual. Letters composed in Pehlvi by Zatspram's brother Manush Chihar, berated Zatspram for this ritual innovation and enjoined that the ancient ritual practices should be re established. <clears throat> Controversies over ritual matters are found throughout the whole history of Zoroastrian religious literature, but became particularly widespread in the 19th century, when certain priests of Bombay sought to establish their priestly independence from the traditional center of the Bagaria Panthak Nausari. One such instance occurred when a controversy broke out between two Sensai priests of Bombay the Stupeshotan Behramji Sanjana of the Vadiyaji Antashviram <clears throat> and Jamaji Minocherji Jamasasa, the future Dastur of the Anjuman Antashviram. The two families had been bitter rivals for decades. But in 1866, when the Stupeshotan republished Dasturji Edelji Sanjana's treatise, entitled The Farmon Edin, The Command of the Religion, on the subject of correct ritual performance during the five Gatha days, Jamaji was angered. Publishing his own treaty, entitled Ready a Farmon Edin, The Refutation of the Command of the Religion, Jamanji argued that what Sanjana had written was incorrect. He further argued that contrary to the practice of the Sanjanas of the Vodiyaji Antashvedam, one should recite the Karda of Tau Ammin Mane. During the Afrinagan ceremony, performed during the Fravarigan days. The disputation about the correct performance of the Afrinagan ceremony raged for some time and continues to this day, with the Bhagariya priest of Nausari continuing the ancient practice of reciting the Kadda of Yao Visada 
During the Afrinagan Ifinashte and Rozgar, <clears throat> while some Bombay priests continue to follow Jama Sasa in reciting the Kadda of Tao of Minmane. Interestingly, the question of which Kadda to recite during the Afrinagan was not a new one. Already in the Avestan Pelvi Nerengestan, it is stated that the Karda of Yao Visada should be recited during all 10 days of the Fravarigan. Text 3 1. As for the 10 days in the Fravarigan, during the first five days, one should recite the Ashem Bahu three times. The Fravarane, the formula for what Ga it is, the Shruman of Aurahe Mazdao and Ashaunam, the Kardag of Yao Visada Avayanti, and concluding with Afrirami. During the five Gatha days, one should recite the Ashen Bahu three times, the Fravarane, the formula for what Ga it is. <clears throat> the Shruman of Aurahe Mazdao, Gathabyo, and Ashaunam, and the Kadag of Yao Visada, and concluding with Afrinagan. Some centuries later, the texts of the Afrinagans were again collected by the famous Parsi priest, Darab Hormuzdiyar, who included their text <clears throat> in manuscripts of his Persian revivals. In Darab Hormuzdiyar's time, the practice of the Afridagan of Ravadagan days, as performed in Iran, was to recite the Kadda of Tao Amin Mane. Text 3 2. The Afrinagan of Ardafravas, in the manner of Iran, in the kingdom of the land of Iran, on the day of Vadadagan, the first Afrinagan, which is called the Ardafravad, is this, as it has been said in the tradition. Recite eight Yatha Ahu Vairyo and three Ashem Bohu prayers, then the Fravarane, and the Ga which it is, then Freshes the Yeja, Aure Mazda Revato Karedangato, concluding with Tao Min Mane Jamiaresh, Yao Ashaunam, up to Daregem Hakma, followed by three Ashim Bahu. Yet, <clears throat> the Arab was aware that this custom of the Iranians was at variance with the Khorasani practice of the five Panthaks of the priests of India and what he refers to as the ancient book, books of the Zen Navasa. Later in his manuscript, he gives the text of the Afrinagan of Arda Fravesh and the Afrinagan Iruzgar. According to the practice of the Indian priests, here he writes that one should instead recite the Karda of Yao Visada. Text 3 3. As the Shruman of the Afrinagan, on the day of Rabardin, month Adar, they recite the Afrinagan of Arda of Ravesh, and also on the day of Khurshid, month Day, which is the death anniversary of righteous Zarathustra. On that day, too, they recite the Afrinagan of Ardao Fravash. The Shruman is as follows. Recite eight Yatha Ahu Vairyos, three Ashem Bohus, and the Fravarane up to until the word Frases the Yecha, then Aurahe Mazdao Raivato Kvaredangato, one should recite Yao Visadha Avayanti until the end. 
In the ancient books of the Zen Devasta, the Afrinagan is written in this manner. But in the rivayats, which has been enjoined by the Iranians, that practice of the first Afrinagan written above is in accordance with the transmitted tradition of the rivayats. <coughs> Thus we can see that Jamaji, Jamasasa was at odds with ancient Bulgaria practice and was instead perhaps influenced by Iranian ritual practice. His ancestor, the first Dastur Jamasasa, had after all been a student of the Iranian priest Jamas Vilayati, though he did not adopt the Kadimi calendar. Jamas Asa gave a fatwa to recite Tao Amhinmane in the Afrinagan of Fireste and Rosgar. But <coughs> he could not practice it in conservative Nausari. His descendants promulgated his fatwa in Mumbai, not in Nausari. They wanted to justify Jama Sasa's fatwa in freedom-loving Mumbai. Still, it is clear in this case that the Bhagariya priests of Nausari today continue the ancient practice already attested in the Nirangistan. Excuse me. And finally, <coughs> the practice of Atak Zor. Finally, I would like to present one final case of ritual change. In this case, a ritual which has been entirely lost within the Parsi community, that of Atak Zor. The, the ritual of offering the fat of a sacrificial animal to the fire is well known from Pahlavi and Persian Zoroastrian literature and from Iranian ritual practice as documented by Mary Boyce during her stay in Sharifabad in 1963-64. When Boyce wrote her article, Arthur Zor and Arzor, in 1966, the custom had almost vanished from living Parsi memory, with only a few elderly Parsis who could remember that in the early part of the 20th century, that sheep or goats would occasionally be slaughtered to be offered to the fire on the fourth day after the death of a person. <clears throat> Yet the ritual of Atta Zor seems to have been commonplace in early centuries, so much so that it is referred to not just in ritual literature, but also in popular songs on the establishment of the Nausari and Jumanathas in 1765 CE, two brothers from Baruch, Dosa and Jiva, composed a commemorative song entitled The Atas Nugit, The Song of the Fire, which is still sung today in Nausari on auspicious occasions. In fact, after my wedding in 1971, some five to seven ladies came to my house in Desai Street, performed the Padiyav Kusti ritual, and began to sing the song, which is elaborated, which is elaborate splitting of syllables, such that the word atas, for example, is sung. Ata, and so on. 
the full performance of the great song of the fire takes about five or six hours. <coughs> In the course of the lyrics of the song, the ladies sing, text 4-1, let us call the shepherd's son, friend, bring a pair of he goats. Come, friends, let us go to the fire. Let the he goat be slaughtered as zor for the Atash Behram. Come, friends, let us go to the fire. A number of variations of the Atash Nugit exist. In one such variant, the Atash Nugit, small song of the fire, sung on the day prior to the marriage, the women again mention the practice of the Atasho singing, O for two, O, I ask the poultry man to bring a crowing cock. May the Atashviram be wakeful always. <clears throat> o, I ask the shepherd to bring a pair of he goats. May the sacrifice in Gujarati called bog be offered to the Atashviram. In yet another song, this one composed in honor of the completion of the Dada by Modi Surat Atash Bharam in 1823. The Atash Zor is again referred to, this time as a ritual to be performed after the consecration of a new Atash Bharam. Text 43. Oh, the Atash Ni Agyari has been built. Call the son of the shepherd. <clears throat> Bring a pair of he goats. Oh, the Atashni Agyari has been built. Slaughter the goat as Zor for the Atash Behram. <coughs> Around this time, during the early 19th century, the ritual of the Atash Zor seems to have become the subject of controversy. A particularly important source for the religious and social history of the Parsi community <clears throat> is a collection of Gujarati documents relating to the Bhagarsat Anjuman of Nausari kept in the Merzirana Library and published by the Bombay Parsi Panchayat in 1933. These documents, the oldest of which date to the 15th century, of the common era <coughs> are a unique and underutilized treasure trove of information about Parsi priestly practice. And to make this resource more broadly available to students of Zoroastrian history, I am currently preparing an English translation and study of this text. <coughs> for publication with Dan Sheffield. Within the documents is found a letter written by the Bagaria Anjuman in the year 1823, wherein they respond to a letter written by Bagaria priest in Mumbai, who complained that the Bombay Parsi Panchayat has begun to promulgate a new booklet of regulations of religious practice, <clears throat> wherein the Atash Zor ceremony is omitted. Text 4.4. <laughs> you, sirs, have written, the members of the Panchayat of Sri Mumbai have prepared books in order to spread new laws and new practices, wherein they have written various matters. And these books might perhaps have reached you as well. And you might have already found out by reading it. In your letter, it is written <coughs> that when a charum of expired souls occurs on the days of Behman, Mor, Ghos, or Ram, in the dawn of that day, they perform the zor of an animal, and its fat is offered to the Pak Pasha Sahib. Or, yes, one minute, 
or if there is no Atashbaram, then it is offered to the Adarian side. Likewise, it should be offered in the Patra of Afridagan of Dhamyazad, and it should be offered in the stump there. <coughs> After giving the details of the preparation of Atarzo ritual, the Nausari priests continue the letter and accuse certain priests of Bombay of selfishness, implying that they support the panchayat in the suppression of the Atarzo, not out of religious conviction, but out of desire for patronage by the powerful panchayat members. <coughs> now, I conclude, as can be seen clearly from the last two cases which I have presented, much of the confusion about the correct performance of Zoroastrian ritual has resulted directly from the fatwas and injunctions of the Bombay Dastus, who, in order to promote their own independent legitimacy, <coughs> oppose the centuries old traditions of the Nausari Bhagariya Panthak. Ironically, it should be noted that these Dastus themselves did not participate in ritual activity after assuming the position of Dastur. <coughs> it is said that the learned priest Eradji Merjirana once said that only if the fatwa loving Dasturs of Bombay were to come to the Urvizga holding the Barsom, could he ever truly understand the importance of ritual. Still, even in cases of severe opposition from Bombay priests, the priests of Gujarat, and especially the Bhagariya Mobir Zabrausari, have maintained their ancient <coughs> Khorasani practices to the last. To conclude my lecture, I should like to remind my colleagues that the study of the Zoroastrian ritual tradition is essential for the correct understanding of the textual tradition. Yet, by the same token, studying the textual tradition allows us to shed light on thorny issues of religious practice. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Well, moving straight on, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Albert, Alberto Cantera to talk to us about sacrifice. Thank you. The celebration of a liturgy for Ahura Mazda has been for more than 2,000 years the main feature of the Zoroastrian self-identity. In the Western text, Mazdayasna means someone who performs a sacrifice to Mazda and is applied mainly to the sacrificer, but also to the members of the community that participate in the performance and obtain the benefits of this sacrifice. Sometimes, Mazdayasna is accompanied by the adjective Saratustri, and the meaning is then someone who performs a sacrifice to Mazda in the way of Saratustra. Most of the Eastern manuscripts of the Vesta contain the Western recitative of, and the ritual direc di directions for the correct celebration of this <coughs> liturgy. Uh, in fact, the only text in the Western language that has been transmitted to us are the long liturgy in its numerous variants and a collection of outer ceremonies, the Jordea Avesta, together with some short treatises on ritual matters. The Denkart and other Pahlavi works describe the, uh, a great Avesta in 21 Nask or books, uh, but this is lost to us. We have only a few fragments of it and then a series of liturgies in a Western language. Only one Nas of the Great Avesta has come to us, the Videvdat, and only because it was included in the recitative of a ceremony, the Videvdat ceremony. 
The Great Avesta was probably written down towards, towards the end of the Sasanian Empire in a script invented for the occasion. We call this first copy the Sasanian archetype. <coughs> Traditionally, it has been assumed that our manuscripts derive from this first copy. Actually, our manuscripts do not correspond exactly to any parts of the Great Avesta. On the one side, they are arranged ritually, whereas, whereas the Great Avesta was arranged scholastically. On the other hand, the manuscripts contain only a minimal part of the contents of the Great Avesta. The traditional explanation is that the extant fragments, uh, that the extant texts are fragments of the Great Avesta that were rearranged in later times for producing the recitative of the liturgy. Accordingly, the actual recitative of the liturgy for Ahura Mazda, the long liturgy, would be a high, a late comp composition made up with surviving fragments of the great Avesta. This view has been challenged in the last years. The ceremonies, especially the long liturgy, existed in Sasanian times even before, independently of the great Avesta. In fact, the Zoroastrian long liturgy continues the tradition of the Indo-Iranian sacrifice. The yasna and the Vedic sacrifice share not only a largely common vocabulary, but also the same ritual structure. Both begin with the present and drinking of a stimulating drink, the hauma or the sauma, and the center consists in an animal sacrifice offered to the fire, and the sacrifice is closed with a service to the fire and the waters. The long liturgy extended its roots through the ill Indo-Iranian times. But when did this ceremony get its actual shape? The Nerangas stamp provides evidence that the long liturgy was celebrated already in Sasanian times in a very similar way as described in the manuscripts. Recently, I have brought into light the close parallelism between the description of the ceremonies, uh, between the description of the ceremonies uh, in the manuscripts and in the Nerangas stamp. You might see in the presentation just a comparison of the beginning of the preliminary to the Yasna in the Nerangestan and in some liturgical manuscripts. But we can trace the actual liturgy much farther back than the Sasanian times. In a recent contribution, Kellens has shown that the description of some sacrifices in Yasna 57 and just 10 fit perfectly the pattern of the long liturgy, including the recitation of some, uh, some old, uh, old Avestan texts. Therefore, the main structure of the long liturgy has already got a shape similar to the actual at the time of the composition of this text. The conclusions of Kellens can actually be extended not only to the structure, but also to the actual recitative of the long liturgy. The recitative is not a late, a late patchwork of fragments of the great Davesta compiled in Sasanian times, or post-Sasanian times, but got its actual form already in the productive time of the Western language, probably still in the Achaemenid time. The clearest proof is provided by the Western text of the Nerangestan. This section of the Husparon Nas has two linguistic layers, a short Avestan text and its Pahlavi translation. The Pahlavi translation is not only a translation, but includes long commentaries providing the most extensive information about the ritual practice in Sasanian times. Today is easily accessible thanks to the edition and translation by Kotval and Kreyenbrook. The Avestan text was probably composed long before the Sasanian era and is then our principal source of information for the pre sasanian ritual practices. In several passages, it's clear that the Western Nerangestan knows the actual version of the long liturgy. In fact, it contains several Nerangs or ritual directions in the Western language similar to the later Nerangs in the Pahlavi, in Pahlavi in the manuscripts. Thus, Nerangestan describes the texting of the drone by the priest exactly as it takes place in the long liturgy and including the same Western recitative. Since this rose drone is, a well is, is as well celebrated as a separated ritual, this passage could only prove the existence of the drone ritual, but not of the complete ceremony. But the same does not apply for the description of the offerings to the Varsom and Nerangestan, that it is identical to Yasna 63.3. Notice that not only the ceremony is the same, 
distractions that appear that appeared in a Western languages in a Western language in the Narangistan appear then in Pahlavi in the liturgical manuscripts. Very interesting is the mention in the Western Narangistan of seven texts during whose recitation the Varsan should be spread. There are seven Avestan texts recited all along the Yasna, and they appear, with one minor exception, exactly in the same order than in the Yasna. The long liturgy and its, ritual res in, in, in its actual recitative is then not a modern patchwork, but an old liturgy whose recitative goes back probably to the Achaemenid times. As every living lit liturgy, and contrary to edited compositions, it shows a range of variations for different purposes. In Gelna's edition of the Avesta, there is only one long liturgy, the Jasna, and a more solemn variant, the Vespera, that is only partially edited. Actually, the manuscripts, witnessing the ritual life from uh, 13th to 19th century, show a wider range of liturgies. The Yasna Rapid, the Yasna Rapid Vin, a smaller ceremony than the standard daily liturgy celebrated only in the summer months. Then the standard morning daily ceremony or Yasna, and the solemn ceremony or Visperat. The latter serves as the basis for more complex ceremonies. So there is a ceremony with an additional pressing of the Haoma after the Yasna Haftan Haiti, that is the Dohoma ceremony, that is attested only in one manuscript, Cast 7b. In notably the oldest one. Yeah? Therefore, it is, however, another type of ceremonies that are still frequent in the manuscripts. I call them intercalation ceremonies <coughs> and are ceremonies in which a young Avestan text is divided in sections and intercalated between the old Avestan texts. The manuscripts attest two such ceremonies, the, uh, the Yasti Vispera Davak Videvdad, also the Videvdad ceremony, and the Vistaspiast. The Pahlavi Nerangestan witnesses still a greater, a greater ritual variety than our manuscripts. Beside the Dohomas, it mentions other ceremonies with still greater number of presence of Haoma, like the Dahomas and the Davas Dahomas. Also, the catalog of the intercalation ceremonies is longer in the Nerangestan. It includes two such ceremonies not attested in the manuscripts, the Vayanjas and the Hadoknas. The first is a ceremony with intercalated just, as rightly noticed by Crayenbrook. As for my part, I have discovered a fragment of this ceremony integrated in the Visperat ceremony. In fact, the list of the textual articulations of the Visperat is originally a fragment of the recitative of the Vayan just, in which some just, just 5, 19, 14, and 10, are intercalated between the Old Avestan texts. The Hadok ceremony was quite likely as well an intercalation ceremony in which Hadok one, Hadok 1 was intercalated after the Asimbuhu and Hadok 2 after Yasna 53. Both ceremonies ceased to be celebrated before the 17th century. Forgetting an idea of the variety of the long liturgy in the Nerangestan is very useful a look into the hierarchical classification and grouping of its different variants according to the number of vason tricks and the proportion of milk and wheat on water and the libation. From these classes of ceremonies, the manuscripts provide evidence only for the Yasti Kesh, the Yasti Rapidvin would belong to this group, the Yasti Havan, the Visperat, the Hadok, and the Dohomast, the latter only in one manuscript. Videvdat and Vistasvias ceremony are to be ascribed probably to the group of the Visperat ceremonies. Obviously, the ritual variety decreases from the Sasanian times to the time of the extant manuscripts, as it happens from the oldest manuscripts to the modern ones. The changes in the different variants of the liturgies concern central parts of the ritual and the recitative. I'll just mention some examples. The meat offering to the fire could be done one or two times. The pressing of the haoma together with the recitation of the homas can be celebrated one, two, or more times during the liturgy. Very interesting are the changes in the, recitations of, in the recitation of the old Avestan texts. Usually, it is assumed that there is only one way to recite the Old Avestan text, 
namely as they appear in Gellner's edition and in the daily ceremony in modern times. However, some deviations are attested. The Yasna Haptan Haiti is recited twice, uh, is recited a second time before Yasna 53 in the Vesperat ceremony. The Vahistoist Gata and the Ariaman Isia are as well, are, are as well repeated in the Dohomas ceremony. Furthermore, the Ustavaiti and the Spentaman Yugata exchange their positions, their positions in the Dohomas ceremony. In the presentation, you might see an overview uh, with the arrangement of the Old Avestan text in the different variants of the long liturgy. In Sasanian times, the long liturgy knows then a wide range of, var of variants and many parts of the ceremonies were still mobile. It was a living ceremony with lots of variants for different purposes and not just a patchwork of erudite compilers. For pre sasanian times, the evidence for variety is not as overwhelming as for Sasanian times, but we have good reasons for assuming a similar or even a greater variety. The intercalation ceremonies provide a nice, a nice example. Traditionally, they have been considered late creations on the base of already existing texts, and so the clearest example of erudite patchwork. According to Boyce, the text of the Videvdat existed independently of the long liturgy as a legal, as a legal treatise, and then in Sasanian times was created as a, a ceremony in which this text was intercalated at random between the old Avastan texts in order to produce a ceremony including a trendy text on purification. The Vistas will have been created after that model. Actually, the intercalated texts are not divided and intercalated among the old Avastan texts at random. On the contrary, these texts were composed to be intercalated among the old Avastan texts, and their intercalation is the result of an interpretative reading of the old Avastan texts. Thus, the intercalation after Yasna 53 of the encounter of the Urban of the disease with, with his own vision is constant in all intercalation ceremonies and, of course, not unintended. Yasna 53 is an actual nuptial hymn for Pauruchista, the daughter, the daughter of Zarathustra, an alter ego of the vision of the Diana. The young Avestan exegesis put correctly this hymn in connection with the encounter of the soul of the deceased with his own vision. The clearest example of the rationale for such, for such intercalations is provided by the Videvdat. Sherbo has shown some years ago that the intercalation of the Videvda depends on a reading of the Old Avastan text as representing the universal history that goes from the creation of the wall, Ahunavaya and Videvda 1, to Zarathustra, Yasna 53 and Videvda 19, and the final victory over Uvol, Ariaman Isia and Videvda 20 to 22. But the connection of the Videvda with the Old Avastan text are, is not limited to this three central moments. Bidevda represents the process of universal purification of the world. It begins with the origins of impurity after the creation of the countries. After presenting the first attempt to restore immortality by Yima, it deals with the greatest impurity, the Nasus. The Vasnun is intercalated after the Yasna Haptan Haiti, presented so as the correspondence in purification ritual to the Yasna Haptan Haiti in the sacrificial rituals. From now on, only minor imp impurity, the Nasa is in Dagan, will appear till the arrival of Sraosa in Bidevdat 18, Zarathustra in 19, and the final purification in Bidevdat 20 to 22. Nothing is at random in the structure of the Bidevdat. It has been composed to be inserted between the Old Avestan texts in order to provide a reading of the Old Avestan text under the motto of the process of universal purification and for creating a special variant of the long liturgy contributing to the universal purification, a kind of varsnum for the whole universe. A further proof of the early existence of, the, of this type of intercalation ceremonies is that its name is already attested in the intercalated ceremonies, in the Vistaspiast and in the parallel version of the Hadoknas. The scene is situated in the encounter of the soul with this vision. She explains to the soul that of the diseases uh, of the deceit, 
that every time he resided the Gata, celebrated the sacrifice to the waters, or satisfied the fire of Ahura Mazda and the man Ashavan, it made the vision more beloved and put her in a more prominent position. Then the speaker changes and Ahura Mazda says, Henceforth, men celebrate a long jasti and a hampar's tea for Ahura Mazda. Through the celebration of the long liturgy, singing the gathas and sacrificing to the fire and the water, is namely to celebrate a jasna, the pious man has made the vision more beloved and has put her in a more advanced position. Then it follows the conclusion announced by Ahura Mazda that this is the reason for the celebration of the long liturgy and the consultation. Darigo jasti hampashti cha. Avestam hampashti is the abstract noun of hamfras, the technical verb for having an interview with Ahura Mazda since the Gathas and into the Pahlavi literature. There is then no doubt. The intercalation ceremonies are not late creations. Actually, we have reasons to assume that they rather belong to the very core of the long liturgy, the special sacrifice to Ahura Mazda introduced by Zarathustra. It is not casual that the mention of the intercalation ceremonies appears in the context of the encounter of the soul with the vision. The function of the vision is to lead the soul of the deceased to Ahura Mazda, and the same function assumes the vision in each sacrifice to Ahura Mazda. She leads the soul of the sacrificer to the presence of Ahura Mazda and allows him to have a consultation with the divinity. After drinking the Haoma, the sacrificer is consecrated. He assumes his function through the right choice of celebrating a sacrifice to Mazda in the way of Zarathustra. This is the Fravarani. Immediately after, he offers the animation of his own body. This is the Tambash Chirhaya Ustanen, as Zarathustra did in Jasna 33, 14. So the sacrificer entered in a state of self self-induced death, emulating the sacrificial victim that is going to be killed at the end of Jasna 34. And his soul, Urvan, will be able to leave the body and accompany the soul of the victim, the Geus Urvan, into the realm of God. Similar ideas are found in the Vedic sacrifice. But there is a particularity of the sacrifice in the way of Zarathustra. This particularity is actually the topic of Bidevda II although it has been often interpreted differently. <coughs> Bidevda too tell us the, the deficiencies of Jima's sacrifice by contrast with this of Zarathustra. The key for the partial failure of Jima in getting the immortality for the creatures lies in his incapacity for being memorizer and bearer, and bearer of the vision. This capacity is exclusive of Zarathustra and his ritual technique. Zarathustra is going to be the memorizer and vida of the vision as every sacrificer perform a sacrifice in the way of Zarathustra after him. Essential for the success of Zarathustra is the Ahuna Vairya that he learned from Ahura Mazda when he or his Fravasi attended the cosmogonic sacrifice. This knowledge allows him acting as Ahura Mazda and reproducing his sacrifice at the beginning of the world history. In a recent contribution, I've shown that the sexual union of the soul with the sacrificer with the vision during the long liturgy continues the Indo-European myth of the within of the sky with, with his daughter, the morning dawn, that brings a new day. In the mythology of the long, of the, of the, the long liturgy, it is the wedding of Ahura Mazda with the vision, Diana. This wedding grants life in the world of the gods. Of gods. Zarathustra, acting as, in the sacrifice as Ahura Mazda, marries his own daughter, Poruchista, alter ego of the vision. Its priest, celebrating the liturgy, acts, acts as Zarathustra, and accordingly, oh, sorry, and accordingly, his soul is united with the vision during the recitation of Yasna 53. <laughs> Through the union with his, with his vision, the soul of the priest gets access to Ahura Mazda and a consultation with him is possible. In contrast to Yima, the priest is now memorizer and vira of the vision, that is, is able to present the vision of the consultation with Ahura Mazda to the ritual community of the Mazda Yasna Zarathustri. Oh, sorry. This is 
thesis. This is exactly an intercalation ceremony. The main innovation is that he's able to perform the consultation before the community and to carry the words of Ahura Mazda to the ritual community. The sacrificer acts as a mediator of information. The transmission of God's message happens through a performance of the consultation between the sacrificer, Zarathustra, and God. The words Purusa Zarathustra Ahura Mazda, Zarathustra acts to Ahura Mazda, announce the beginning of the performance. The words of Ahura Mazda are marked by Adam Raut Ahura Mazda. Then Ahura Mazda says, it is a kind of theatrical performance of the consultation. This representation was originally intercalated after Yasna 53, the Vahistoist Gatha. But then the intercalation extended to other sections of the Old Avestan text, giving occasion for exegetical readings of this central text of the liturgy and for creating new ritual uses for them. I assume that all of Western texts belonging to the Hamparsti genre, including some nags of the great Avet, uh, some nags of the great Avesta, were composed to be recited in to be recited and intercalated in the long liturgy. This is the context for the Western text presented as a consultation between Zarathustra and Ahura Mazda. These consultations do not tell us a historical meeting of Zarathustra and Ahura Mazda or a mystic encounter with God but a ritual meeting made possible through a ritual technique. The vision appears then as the capacity for the consultation reached through the sacrifice and on the same time as the vision of the consultation itself, that is, its contents, its contents. So we can understand the meaning of Diana as tradition or corpus of the religious text. Every consultation transmitted to men in the long liturgy is Diana is part of the vision of the realm of gods obtained by the sacrifice during the ceremony. The structure of the ceremonies of intercalation is therefore at least as old as the composition of the young Avestan texts presented as a consultation. Even the use of Diana as corpus of the religious text in the young Avesta depends on the existence of this kind of ceremonies. So the intercalation ceremonies are not a late creation. Already believed that two presents this ritual technique at the main, as the main difference between the sacrifice of Zarathustra and this of Yima. I would go so far as to affirm that the daily celebration, the Yazizan of the manuscripts and the Yasna of the Western, Western editions is not the basic ceremony that have been extended through the addition of intercalated texts. On the contrary, it is an intrinsic feature of the Yasna Zarathustri that it makes possible at consultation with the divinity and its performance before the ritual community. Neither the standard daily celebration of the long liturgy nor its more complex forms like the visperat or the ceremonies <coughs> of intercalation are late compositions on the basis of the extant fragments of the great Avesta, but real ceremonies that had been celebrated for centuries without any inter interruption. The recitative of the ceremony is not an artificial patchwork of post sasanian times, but the product of a long-lasting ritual activity in an oral tradition. The long liturgy is a living ceremony that knows many variants for different ritual purposes since the oldest periods we can trace back. The composition of the very core of the liturgy, the Ahuna Vairyo, is attributed to the god Ahura Mazda. The ritual innovation of the vision transmitted to the ritual community is ascribed to Zarathustra and was only possible because he attended the cosmogonic sacrifice of Ahura Mazda and learned the Ahuna Vairyo. The key, the key, or in a Western words, the ratu, of the long liturgy. Thus, the recitative in a Western language is consubstantial with the liturgy. When in Achaemenid times the liturgy was exported from Eastern Iran to the Western regions of the Achaemenid Empire, the liturgy continued being celebrated in a Western language. The reasons why pre uh, precisely this liturgy in a Western language was so successful remain hidden to us. His adaptation as the, standard, as the standard liturgy for the cult of Ahura Mazda by the Achaemenid kings in the context of a royal cult is a plausible explanation, but unfortunately, only that. And I thank you very much for that. <laughs>
We are given the idea that Zoroaster's teaching is something sublime, something about you know, the mind, and then somehow it d sort of uh, becomes a matter of ritual <coughs> practice, etc. So that's very disturbing to me, and I'd like to know why that's the kind of message that you seem to, your paper seems to be giving. And, and to the last speaker, I'd like to say that clearly you must be, uh, you know, you are speaking at a very high level and people like me wouldn't understand if a little bit of context could be given. So for example, uh, this sacrifice, you mentioned sacrifice without actually explaining what that sacrifice is. So it's left to our fantasy and that can't be right. Well, if we may answer first, this uh, what I what I presented here was based on the Hazucht Nask, and there it states very clearly what produces a good diner. That is reciting the sitting down, reciting the gatas, and worshiping the good waters and the fire. So that's what the texts say, and of course worshiping Mazda. But uh, you're quite right. The uh, uh, be, uh, underlying this is, of course. Uh, a diner Mazda Yasni has a, there is a religious system behind it, but it manifests itself in the worship of Mazda in practice in its visible form. The, the most obvious distinctive feature for it is that Mazda is worshipped and not the divers. And there are obviously reasons why one should worship Mazda and not the diner. And there you come into the religious system that underlies the worship of Mazda. Yes, uh, as for my part, I would say that this debate on Diana and the real uh, meaning of Diana, if it really means something more than a ritual uh, technique, so to say, I would, I would call it a, a ritual technique, is, is, is a matter of debate. I, I don't think that it's in the oldest uh, text we can say that there is a religious system behind the word Diana. It is my view. I think it's the core of everything which is transmitted in this, in the frame of the ritual. Every consultation to God is Diana, and in, in that sense, every consultation that is produced through the right ritual is going to be Diana. The contents of this Diana is different. Also in Bidev, that is clear that it is not just a matter of, purif of, of ritual practice, as is a, is a matter of purification and so on. That's, but you know, the, this is a very controversial topic. And the other question, which is the sacrifice. Also the, when, with the word sacrifice, I mean a offering of a piece of meat to the fire. It, it, it doesn't mean exactly that the victim has to be killed in the same sacrifice, because it can be, after the end of Yasna 34, it can be killed out of the ritual place, but it doesn't need to be killed in the frame uh, of the sacrifice. It can be already killed before, but it is essential that you offer a piece of meat at the beginning of the Yasna Haftan Haiti. And this is what I call a sacrifice. And it was still the, the normal practice in the Zanian times. And it, yeah, uh, when it happens that does, it doesn't belong to the very core of the sacrifice, it's difficult to decide. Yes. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes. <coughs> I'm Ardeshiran of Shiravani. I've been a uh, student of uh, Zartoshti religion for the past 30 years. And uh, I, an invited speaker to various universities and various conferences. And uh, really, so far, listening to a few speakers here, make me think that I've never been Zartushti. I have believed in different religion, the religion which was brought by Zar Zaratushtra and was spoken in the Gathas. And in the Gathas, of course, we worship Mazda. Mazda means all, no, it means all. Could Huge. I take your question because we're short of time? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, you asked, people to 
state something and I'm making my statement and I'm coming from a country where there is a, a freedom of speech and people can speak and I don't understand that opposite points of views have not been represented so I take my another minute to explain what my question is. Where people get this idea that sacrifice has been part of Zarathustra's teachings that speaks of imaginary gods. All you are talking here about are imaginary gods who want meat, who want sacrifice in order to establish Atash Bahram, which is the highest and holiest fires in the Zarathustra religion. Do we need to sacrifice male goats? Is this what you've been taught in this conference? And I thank you very much for allowing me to say this much. Well, thank you for that comment, uh, and it's well taken. Uh, we were talking about text, so it's what, what the texts say, not what these people here think about them. Uh, let's take any more questions. Yes, at the back. whether it is ritualized or a personal, from coming from a personal point of view or a community point of view. So I have no problems with uh, accepting the word sacrifice. My question to Dastoji Kotwal is, um, when was the orthodox uh, uh, sacrifice or the practice of orthodox ritual established? Is it established? by one person of priestly renown, or a panel, or is it an evolution? <coughs> what is her question? Could you, could you just put your question into a nutshell so that Dastroji can understand exactly what you're asking, sure. please? Um, when ritual practice of orthodoxy was established, was it established by one priest of renown uh, or a panel, or is it through a evolution of ritual practice where the orthodox correctness of ritual was established? <coughs> Whether, whether it was in, started by an individual or a committee or whether it developed by organic, organically. Zoroastrian so, so sacrifice. Who decides the change? I think the answer to your question, if I may, while he's thinking, is that since this is called Zoroastrianism, the original inspiration for this whole tradition is based upon the words of Zarathustra in the Garthas. So if you want to look for a source, the Zoroastrian tradition takes that as the source. Hence, it's called Zar Zoroastrian. Would you like to say anything? Now you see, sacrifice means sacrifice. There is no committee as such that has established sacrifice, you see? It has come down to us since time immemorial, and even up to 19th century also, if you see the Gujarati translation <coughs> of Kavazi Kanga, there in chapter 11 of the Yasna, and chapter 8 of the Yasna, when drone chasni is done, so at that time also he has written that in ancient times, as Goshodo, a kebab was put there as a chasni product. And you see this Goshodo means what? It means animal product. And laterly, the priests began to use ghee or clarified butter. And so this sacrifice has been abundant since more than 100 years in India. And instead of cow product, 
they use cow product as ghee and not meat. Thank you very much. We have to stop here.